Good morning, everybody. First of all, if you have cell phones, if you be so kind as to shut them off. My name is Avigdis Slatis. I'm rabbi of Congregation of the Neighbor of Jacob. We want to welcome each and every one of you to this very special tribute to an outstanding man. Before I say anything further, I must mention, Barbara, your efforts. This is a, over a year and a half because of the COVID, how we had to delay and postpone. And even the funeral itself, we had, I mean, the bare minimum that was allowed at that time. And you kept saying, Leon deserves more. He absolutely deserves more. And knowing Leon, he was probably saying, it's okay. It's all right. Don't, don't disturb anybody, it's okay. But you persevered, and it's a great tribute, not just to you, but to the, your relationship with Leon, your love and your devotion. So I thank you for making this a reality. <clears throat> I want to begin first by reading in Hebrew and then English the 23rd Psalm. If you join with me, we'll say the 23rd Psalm in English. Notice I didn't ask you to say it in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There are many speakers this morning who want to express their love, affection, and gratitude to Leon, to Arya Leib, that was his Hebrew name, and Sri Hirsch. So I'm going to keep my words, my remarks, very brief. Leon was a very special man. He was generous. He was the one you could turn to. He was he was a rock. He was composed, he was calm. He would see the entire picture. And he always had a plan how to approach it. He would never allow himself to be overwhelmed, but rather he was the captain of the ship. No matter what the storm confronted him, he was there and he made us all feel safe and secure. Leon was a wonderful man, helping so many, and he was a dear, dear friend. And he was a man of great faith. He loved this synagogue. He loved this congregation. He loved his community. He loved people. And we all probably have numerous stories, Leon stories, stories about this man who came from humble beginnings, and he never forgot that. He never let his success translate into anything other than an opportunity to helping others. We miss Leon. It seems very selfish that I should say that, but we all miss Leon. <clears throat> On one of our holiest days, Day of Atonement Yom Kippur, Leon had the final concluding and one of the most prestigious honors 
of the service. And he was there until the very, very end of the service. He closed the ark, marking the conclusion. And after it was all finished and the congregation would all be singing and rejoicing, I would go over to Leon every year and he would give me that bear hug <laughs> as only Leon can do. We would embrace and I always used to say, don't leave me big guy, I need you. I remember he, when I went to visit him just a few days before he left this earthly existence. And he said, Rabbi, I have to apologize. I think I'm leaving. Leon was just remarkable. At this point, I want to call Josh, whoever else to come, the master of ceremonies, and please everybody, speak your heart and express what your soul motivates you to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rabbi Slatis, for those wonderful words and for opening up the BBJ for today's event. Uh, Rabbi Slatis and the BBJ have always been integral parts of the lives of Ish, aka Doc, aka Leon, in so many ways, as well as for the whole family. And it's very appropriate that we're here today celebrating um, Leon. Um, Leon, as, as <clears throat> Rabbi Slatis mentioned, loved this place, and he mentioned the honor that uh, Leon got at the end of the Yom Kippur service every year. And I remember the first time I came here and saw that, and um, it was remarkable that he had been bestowed this honor. And you could tell that um, he had been such an important part of the community here. Um, and in his estimable way, Rabbi Slatis uh, understated the impact that he had on Leon throughout his life. Leon loved Rabbi Slatis. The family loved Rabbi Slatis. And at the very end, the person that Leon dot dad wanted to see was Rabbi Slatis. As he was leaving, he wanted to be comforted and to know that it was gonna be okay. And I think that's why he was able to let go because of Rabbi Slater. So we will forever be grateful to him. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Josh Marks and I'm married to Hetty, um, Leon's youngest daughter. And we have three wonderful kids sitting in the front row, Jacob, Charlie, and Ella. Um, will you guys just stand up really quick and just <laughs> say hi? Or just, come on. Anyway. Belly, belly, always. So uh, Barbara has asked me and Bruce Sarkeesian, Linda's husband, to act as co-host for today's event, celebrating Leon's life. Um, and one, one of so many remarkable things about Leon is the host of nicknames that he had. So um, people called him Leon, obviously. Some people called him Lee, for sure. I've heard Lion being thrown about once or twice. Um, his brother Sam called him Charlie. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe somebody could tell, tell us. His brother Ben called him Bro. They called each other Bro Ben, Bro, Bro Leon. Um, his grandkids called him Ish. And I assume somebody's going to explain that later on in the speaker set. Um, some folks even called him Boychuk. <laughs> Um, he had friends calling him Boychik. Um, to his kids, he was dad. To me and Bruce, he was Doc. Uh, he, is, he was Dr. Aronson. And I was a big Bugs Bunny fan growing up. And I would always love to say, what's up, Doc? Um, and to, um, to his kids, he was each. Um, he was a man of many nicknames, many talents. Um, 
been an incredibly challenging year, as the rabbi said, and very, very hard for us to wait 18 months to pay tribute to him. Um, and I remember being at the funeral and there was 10 of us there sitting graveside. And I remember thinking how uh, painful that was because um, we wanted there to be hundreds and we knew there would be hundreds there if not for COVID. Um, but it's a testament to how much Leon was so important to everybody here and so many people on Zoom um, that we have such a great turnout today and virtually and wanted to thank everybody for being here in person and online. Um, today is intended to be a celebration of his life. We have a wonderful cast of family, friends, and even former students of his um, to describe all the ways that he inspired us and touched our lives. And at the end, we're going to have a little bit of music from his two favorite all-time singers. Um, so stay tuned for that. So um, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this tribute. Um, I'm actually first up, so. Um, um, so I want to tell you a little bit about my history with this man. Um, I first met Doc back in Chicago during the summer of 1995. I'd been living in Madison, Wisconsin and working for something called the Endangered Species Coalition, trying to convince the public and Congress of the importance of saving endangered plants and animals. Betty and I had just started dating and Doc was in town for a dental conference in Chicago and he wanted to have an audience with me, which turned out to be not so much an audience as an inquisition. <laughs> For an hour, he grilled me on topics ranging from the environment, Israel, gun control, <laughs> politics, anti-Semitism, tax cuts, and of course, sports. But most importantly, the Georgia Bulldogs and what I knew about college football. Um, and of course, I'm a New Yorker, so what I know about college football is nothing. <laughs> I think that was the first sign that maybe I wasn't the right choice. <laughs> but he was relentless. And it was one of the most nerve wracking hours of my life. But I held my own. And I think I gained his respect, which was important because I'm pretty sure he wasn't terribly excited about his baby daughter dating a Yankee tree hugging liberal. <laughs> A concept as foreign to him as someone in Savannah rooting for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Later that summer, I would visit Hetty and Doc and BB in Savannah, and a tropical storm would park itself over Savannah for a whole week, as if to say, we don't like Yankee tree hunters down here. <laughs> And then that Thanksgiving, <laughs> at their house in Tybee, there was a strain of stomach flu oh, so bad that I spent half the holiday indisposed. <laughs> you know where that is. And we actually made t-shirts saying that we sur survived the turkey trot <laughs> and the Tybee strain. <laughs> And yet still I wouldn't go away. <laughs> Nothing would keep me away from Hetty and ultimately from dating an incredible second father and second mother too. During, uh, despite his initial reluctance to embrace this green Yankee, Doc, did, Doc didn't hesitate when it came time to pitch in to help save the planet. In 1997, I moved to Atlanta to be with Hetty and started working for the Sierra Club and leading a campaign to save the Okefenokee Swamp in South Georgia for mining. And those of you who don't know, the Okefenokee Swamp is one of the world's great ecosystems. Um, it's a beautiful place. And one day I said to Doc, how would you like to help me with this campaign? And before I knew it, he said, yes, but he went beyond that. He started an organization called DDS, which those of you who know about dentists normally says doctor of dental science, but he converted it into dentist defending the swamp. 
He wrote letters to dentists all around the state, urging them to put petitions in their waiting rooms for his patients and their parents so that they would sign calling on DuPont, the, the mining company, to give up their plans. He got over 120 dentists around the state of Georgia engaged and collecting uh, thousands of signatures. And the Savannah newspaper even covered his efforts. He and I even ended up going to Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress on the issue. And his efforts played a significant role in convincing the company to give up the project and save the swamp. And when it came time to pick a place to celebrate his 60th birthday, where did he want to go? The Okefenokee, of course. Over the course of the 25 years that I knew him, he was simply a force of nature, unlike anyone I'd ever met. And to this day, I've never met, and I don't think I'll ever meet anybody like him. His passion for his profession was incredible, not just in the daily work in building and running a successful orthodontic practice, but also his promotion and strengthening the practice of dentistry around the globe. He loved teaching and mentoring orthodontic students in St. Louis and Augusta and beyond. And it's a testament to his brilliance as a teacher that many of his students are here today. And all of them will tell you what an amazing teacher and friend and mentor he was. He loved traveling and exploring the world. I think he and BB have visited over 50 countries in every continent except Antarctica. And I think that if he had lived much longer, he probably would have gone there as well. I probably would have dragged him. And my family and I were the beneficiaries of their generosity when they took us to Iceland and Israel, and my kids got to see him enjoying being in the Holy Land together. He and I shared a love of history. Seemingly every Thanksgiving, he and I would battle over trivial pursuit. And during the last months of his life, we bonded over exploring his Russian ancestry, and especially the incredible story of his father's escape to the US and discovering the grave of his grandfather in Atlanta which he had never known about before. Jacob and I uh, discovered it. He was fascinated by public affairs and politics, and we constantly debated the issues of the day. In his last years, during the presidency of Donald Trump, honestly, our arguments got a little bit more feisty. And many times he would say to me, Josh, his nickname for me was Josh, not Josh. He'd say, Yash, you're a lost cause. <laughs> but we always ended our conversations on good terms. You will hear a lot about, a lot today about how he was always friendly to strangers. He never knew a stranger, whether on the beach, at, at Tybee, or at a restaurant. And this anecdote gets told all the time. We get told many times today. But I'll never forget the first July 4th, we spent together walking the Tybee Beach. And there's just millions of people at Tybee, as you guys all know, if you've been there for July 4th. And it took us an hour to walk about 30 feet uh, because every 10 feet or so, somebody would stop them and say, Dr. Aronson, I'm so-and-so, you fixed my teeth 27 years ago. <laughs> and he would say, I remember you so-and-so, didn't you have an impacted wisdom tooth? <laughs> and I remember we did X, Y, Z, A, B, C to bring that tooth down. And he would always say, okay, open your mouth and bite down. <laughs> he would always check to make sure the smile was as good as he left it. Um, he was always taking great pride. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He had an unbelievable sense of humor, as you all know. He loved to cut up and laugh and bust everybody's baitsum, <laughs> which for the non-Yiddish speakers is a word, the translation of which I'm not supposed to say inside this beautiful synagogue, um, but when you look it up, you'll nod your head and say, absolutely. <laughs> One of my all time favorite pranks was watching him putting in a set of fake awful teeth at a restaurant 
He'd be sitting having a meal. Look, you just have sat down. And he'd say, Yash, watch this. <laughs> he'd take out a set of awful teeth, like with an inch of space in between and pop them in his mouth. And when the waitress would come to take the order, he'd smile and say, can you recommend a good dentist around here? <laughs> I mean, he should have been on tour. It's unbelievable. Um, he was an incredible family man. He always said, there's nothing like family, Josh. Don't forget that. And I especially loved watching him interact with our kids. He loved riding the waves with all of them at Tybee. From when they were super small, he would carry them on his shoulders out to the waves and they would bob up and down or watching them play with the metal detector on the beach where he would secretly buried change in the sand and smile when the kids discovered the buried treasure. He said, Yash, don't tell them. He's like, don't worry, Doc, I won't. He loved rocking with Ella on the famous port swing at the Tybee house. And she would lie across his lap and he would write words on her back and he would you know, she would have to guess what the words were. And then he loved watching her play guitar and sing in recitals and ride in horseback competitions as she got older. He loved watching um, Jacob, our oldest son, his first grandson, perform as Lurch in uh, the Galloway High School's production of The Addams Family and then took incredible pride along with all of us when Jacob and his choir went to Carnegie Hall in New York and sang as part of the National Youth Choir. And he admired Charlie's passion for climbing and exploration uh, and adventure. And Charlie was always the one when we did the trip to Iceland, he was always the one who was most uh, adventurous and exploring and jumping around. Uh, it was so great to see them interact um, and he called Charlie Haas, which for those non-Southerners means somebody of big stature, because Charlie is now approaching six feet, and I have to look up to him, much to my chagrin, um, and Charlie called him Sir. So it was Sir and Haas against the world. Golf was a big deal with, with Leon and I, with Doc and I, and we had a blast during the rounds of golf that we played, which was too many to count. And in the early days, when he was at full strength, he and I would go neck and neck. And in later years, he and I would often team up against Bruce, otherwise known as the Bruiser, um, who was a much better golfer than Doc and I. So we would team up against Bruce. And every match would be, in Doc's words, a bloodbath. And he would always joke that, okay, guys, next time I'm inviting ESPN to film it because it's going to be ready-made television entertainment. It was on the golf course that he taught me what were known as the smudgeisms, named after his older brother, Sam, whose nickname was Smudge. And along with Leon is probably one of the most remarkable men I've ever met in my life. When he would hit a good drive on the golf course, Leon would say, let the big dog eat. <laughs> And I was like, Doc, what does that mean? <laughs> so I'm from New York. I don't know this. He said, Josh, I smacked the out of the ball. <laughs> and when I would hit my putt past the hole, which was too many times to count, he would say, get his tag number, as if it was a speeding car. You know. <laughs> When he would hit an especially good iron shot or pitch into the green close to the hole, he would often say, Josh, there's still a little juice left in this berry. Don't you forget that. And I think that described him in the last many years of his life. Till the bitter end, there was a lot of juice left in that berry, which he showed in the valiant fight he fought to stick around so he could keep enjoying life, his friends, and especially his kids, grandkids, and most importantly, his sparrow, Mibi. In the last conversation we had, we talked about the latest mining threat to the Okefenokee, 
which he had actually alerted me to, because he had gotten an alert. He said, Yash, they're coming after our swamp again. We got to get the band back together. And he said, Yash, you got to keep the fight going. And I said, Doc, you got it. I will never give up for that place. And so it turned out that the conservative, bulldog loving Southerner was at the very end an environmentalist. Doc was an amazing father in law, friend, mentor, family man, inspiration, and simply the man. And while I'm so sad that he's not with us any longer, I am so honored that I got to know him and be a part of his life. If he were here right now, he'd probably be saying, Yash, it's time to put out the fire and call in the dogs. His unique way of saying it's time to wrap up because you've been talking for too long. <laughs> of course, he had a different way of describing how the fire was actually put out which I'm also not allowed to say inside a synagogue, but hopefully you catch the drift. Thank you. So you're not getting rid of me so easily. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first of many uh, extraordinarily close friends. Uh, the first one is Sandy Carter. Sandy Carter Jurgensen has been a dear friend of the Aronson family for 45 years. As friends, they traveled together, shared happy and sad times together, and the two families' children grew up together. They've been very, part, very much a part of one another's family's lives. And Sandy is like a third sister that Barbara absolutely cherishes. Sandy Carter Jurgensen. We had a lion in our lives. And before I tell you how he got that nickname, I want to tell you who the we are. We are the family of the Aronson Carters. We've been together, as Josh says, for all these many years. I want to share with you the qualities of the lion. And if you'll notice, I have on my lion shirt today and my lion pen. Before I tell you how he got the nickname, the qualities of a lion, which you all know, is one of bravery, one of courage, one of being protective, and one of respect. Another quality of a lion is you can hear his roar for five miles. <laughs> now, for those of you, all of you, who are familiar with Leon's booming voice and his great laugh, you know that when he walked into a room, he brought the party. And when he said to you hello in that booming, booming voice of yours, it's one that stays in your mind forever. One of the other qualities of a lion is that he's a great hunter. Well, our lion hunted for fun and laughter in good times and he always wanted to include the family and he was always looking for something special to do like the time he decided he wanted us all to go camping on little tiny <laughs> <laughs> well those of you who know my best friend barbara <laughs> camping not so much <clears throat> but off she went great sport we got over there, the other girls were making fun of my son. <laughs> He's the only one who thought to bring a little pop tent. <laughs> well, they laughed until the thunderstorm came that night. <clears throat> and they all found themselves trying to cram into Robbie's tent. So we spent a terrifying night when we were flat on the sand for the thunderstorm to leave us. We never did that again. <laughs> And there was a time that Leon went rafting up in North Georgia <laughs> with maybe some of you. He decided that'd be a good family trip. <laughs> so 
off we went up to North Georgia, piled the kids in. We got there late and we wanted to feed the kids, get them to bed. And we walked into the adjoining restaurant. It was the only time I have ever seen an electric fly zapper <laughs> on the inside of a restaurant, <laughs> right over the buffet. <laughs> I can sense Barbara Tinsley. <laughs> Cleon says, it's going to be fine. Let's just eat. You know, we'll just get the kids bed. Tomorrow we'll go around. So we ate a greasy meal, went next door, walked in. The place had not been cleaned. You know, dirty dishes everywhere. Beds had not been made. Leon says, oh, don't worry. This is a great place. This is where we stayed. They cleaned it up and everything. Feel the hairs in the back of Barbara's neck. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That might have worked, except one of the kids went upstairs to use the bathroom. And when they flushed the toilet, it overflowed, poured down the living room and onto our feet. Barbara's like a roadrunner. <laughs> She's out of there. <laughs> Finds us another place to stay. We never did that again. <laughs> so then we decided that we were sophisticated enough to maybe tra start traveling in Europe. This time it was just the adults. So we were in Italy, I think, this time. But Leon became enamored with the bathroom facilities. He, every time he would use the restroom, he would come out and he would describe the beautiful tile work and the fixtures. And he just said, you know, I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna call it the Toiletten of Europe. <laughs> well, I never saw that on the bestseller list. This particular time, we were so green. We didn't know how to read. We had train tickets, didn't know how to read where we were supposed to sit. Didn't, couldn't speak the language, couldn't get anybody to help us. And that was the time before cell phones and GPS. And I don't think we had a piece of wheeled luggage. And Bob and I like to travel a lot. Like, anyway, Leon said the only reason we brought him along was to schlep our luggage. When we finally got up to the conductor to find out where to sit, he said, just get on, just get on the train, get on, it's okay. So we got our luggage and we got on the train and we found this really nice compartment. With, you know, so we said, this looks nice. So we got in and got settled in, clickety clack, clack, clack. Well, that was great until the next stop. And the people who really had tickets for that compartment <laughs> booted us out. So we got up, found another place to stay. I think we did that two or three more times before there were no seats. We never found our seats. Where we did find ourselves was piled on sitting on top of our luggage in between two train cars. <laughs> and that's the way we got to Italy. We never did that again. <laughs> but for all the nevers, there were so many always. We were always together for sad times and happy times and stressful times and just all kinds of times that families do. And our lion was always there for us. Like the rabbi said, the lion was our rock. You know, when the lion was interested in you and cared about you, he knew all about you. I don't care if you grew garlic or made yo-yos, he was gonna find everything about you so he could talk to you about that. And if he saw you 20 years later, he'd remember and he'd talk to you about that. <clears throat> I remember he used to tell me, Zip, but well, you know the lion has nicknames for everybody. He'd say, Zip, you know this Jesus of yours is really a good guy. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you, Leon. There are a lot of people that feel that way. <laughs> you do know he was a rabbi, right? And then another time when, after I'd been seeing my husband dating John for, for, for years, many years, <laughs> He used to tell me, Zip, you need to marry John. He's a real good man. And he was right as always. And I did. And we became the Aronson Carter Jurgensen family that we are today. The memories 
that I have and that we have for our families are just like yours. They're just numerous. They're numerous. I have special memories of when Hetty and Ginger, my daughter's Ginger and Hetty's friend, Leon called her Snap. <laughs> <laughs> they were sitting, sitting down with Hetty on one knee and Ginger on the other, and they were listening to an outdoor concert. And there he was with his arms around both of them, loving, protecting. I have other great memory of my son. I'm very thankful when my son Steve who had a little trouble adjusting to college. And there was Uncle Leon for him, advising him, helping him, mentoring him, and taking care of him. But my best memory is for my son, Robbie. Leon gave Robbie his first job when he was 12 years old, working in his lab. Named him Scooter. <laughs> <laughs> and the lion and Scooter became a very special part of each other's heart. So I promised to tell you how the lion got his name. We were on yet another train. This time we could find our seats. This was in France. We were going through the south of France. And Leon, in his best booming South Georgia Adel voice, said, man, this lion's a big city, isn't it? <laughs> it was El Wyoming, Leon, France. So then we started teasing him and we said, okay, if El Wyoming, Leon, France is lion, then your name, Leon, must be lion. So what started off as L Y O M became L I O M. The lion. And that's what the lion became to us, and that's how he got his name. Now, one more characteristic of a lion is the only big cat that likes to be part of a group called a pride. And we were proud to be a part of his pride. He will always be the king of our jungle. Thank you so much, Sandy. Our next speaker is Dr. Ronnie Weathers. Ronnie sent us his resume, which was two pages long, single spaced. And when I asked him if he had a shorter version, he said, that was the shorter version. This man, like Leon, is a force of nature, which is one reason I think he and Leon were such good friends. He was born in Milledgeville, Georgia, only two months before Leon in 1938. He's married to Jean, a former legal assistant in Atlanta, and they have four kids and five grandkids. He received his pre-dental, dental, and specialty dental training at Emory University. From 1964 to 1985, he practiced general dentistry part-time in Decatur, Georgia, while also teaching at the Emory Dental School. From 1985 to 1992, he was dean of the Emory Dental School and also practiced oral pathology at the Emory Clinic. He served on and chaired numerous committees of several dental organizations, including the American Dental Association. He's the author of over 70 peer reviewed articles and book chapters about dental matters. And in short, if it has something to do with teeth, gums, or anything else in the mouth, he's an expert on it. He's also a former captain in the Air Force, like Leon, a passionate outdoorsman, a tremendous public speaker, an unparalleled jokester, which hopefully you'll find, and a great friend. Please welcome Dr. Ronnie Weathers.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, Barbara, thank you for having me go ahead and uh, speak. Uh, it's such an honor. Thank you. <laughs> Today, we're gathered not to mourn the loss of our great friend Leon Nairns, but to celebrate his life. We are all grateful for the time we had with this special friend. As been said already, this country boy came from the little town of Adel, Georgia, and achieved some of the greatest dreams anyone could possibly imagine. Leon Aronson was also known as Chief ILA, Irwin Ish, and some other things uh, we can't really say. Uh, I heard some new ones actually. So he had uh, many, many titles. Uh, he was a complex man, so it's difficult to know exactly where to start talking about him. Uh, so I'll just say that he was one of the most wonderful men that I've ever known. He was courageous. He battled his disease for six years and wouldn't give up until it finally conquered him. I've known Leon for many, many years, and I can't even remember when I didn't know him. So I'll just begin at dental school because as soon as I met him there, uh, we became instant friends. I think maybe everyone who met him felt that same way. He was just a, a magnet. I constantly think of the travels we made together, the meals we shared, the deep pondering conversations, which some of you have alluded to, uh, the celebrations and wonderful events we were involved in together, the emails and the laughs. Wonderful sense of humor. One of our events together that comes to mind is a trip to Bilbao, Spain for an ICD meeting. His immense gentleness, love, and concern was demonstrated when my wife had a medical emergency and he contacted a friend of his who was an OBGYN. Now, I never asked how he knew an OBGYN in Bilbao, but uh, Anyway, he got him to see my wife on a Saturday in his office and solve a problem. Now, I don't know how the word got around that she had had a miscarriage. I think Leon may have started that rumor, but uh, I was as terrible as a hospital operator. It couldn't have been that. He had a wicked sense of humor unlike any I've ever known. And many of you have experienced that. He was, uh, it was also on a trip to Spain that we went to a restroom at the same time. After we came out, Leon proudly displayed to everyone the photograph of me answering nature's call. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wicked. <laughs> I love to hear the man laugh, and he laughed hard and often. In fact, just him laughing made me laugh. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Leon and Barbara were members of a very exclusive dinner club. It was called JAWS, J-A-A-W-S. This acronym was for Johnson, Allen, Aronson, Weathers, and Smith. And over the years, some personnel changed, changed and now it's called JAWD, J-A-W-D, but it's still the same uh, as it was with fewer people who been in the room. One of my favorite pastimes was to listen to Leon as our group was gathered for a meal in a restaurant as we did for each person's birthday. He would always engage the waiter or the waitress or waitron, whatever the server, uh, as they happily greeted us. And Leon would immediately say, why are you working here? How long have you been married? Oh, how long have you been divorced? Was it an amicable or a contested divorce? Do you have any children? How many? What are their names? Who looks after them while you're working? Do you have any current boyfriends or girlfriends? Is it a serious relationship? Are you living together? Does he or she treat you well? Are you planning to get married? And on and on, it was the darnest thing I've ever witnessed. But by the time Leon finished, we were close friends with the person, and we got wonderful service. Uh, Leon even sometimes gave them some advice depending on what jewels he uncovered as he had 
one-sided soliloquy. Uh, but he was genuinely interested in that person. And uh, he was concerned for it. So it wasn't just idle conversation. Leon was just a special loving man. And most of all, he dearly loved and worshiped Barbara. She was his little sparrow, as he often loved to call her. One of our favorite celebrations was the annual job combined Hanukkah and Christmas get together for dinner and opening of presents uh, from each other. What a wonderful event that always was. Leon was at his best with his quips, laughter, and jokes. Each family took turns uh, hosting the party and sometimes even entertainment was provided. I remember one time we were at Leon and Barbara's uh, town home in Savannah, absolutely drop dead gorgeous place. Uh, they had a singer come in and provide, I've forgotten his name now, but provide us with Nat King Cole-like songs for a while. It was really awesome. So we, we really had some great uh, dinners on our Hanukkah and Christmas. I so often benefit, benefited from his wise counsel. He was always available to answer any problem you approached him with, and he readily shared his wisdom. When Emory Dental School was closed under my deanship, there was no one else who could possibly do the job of addressing the maybe graduated class at the final commencement But Leon. He gave a magnificent performance. Uh, he also taught at uh, UGA Dental School at St. Louis, and he freely shared his knowledge, skill, and advice with the students and the residents, and they all loved him. Leon was also incredibly active in organized dentistry. In addition to his thriving, busy orthodontic practice, he became the leader of the world uh, when he became president of the International College of Dentists. Now, I'll have to explain this to you best I can. Uh, you probably aren't familiar with this organization, uh, but it is kind of the super cool magnum of uh, all dental organizations. Uh, the organization is composed of different sections representing different countries throughout the world. Each of those countries has a president of that country of the organization. And Leon was elected the president and the leader of all the presidents of all the countries of the world, as well as all the membership. So he was the tutu de tutu. Uh, he was truly the big community. And during that year, he performed in an exemplary ma uh, manner, as you might expect him to do. And great strides were made in this organization during his presidency. And, and uh, he, he, he was so well respected by people all over the world. His generosity was legendary. He generously supported his synagogue and many other civic organizations. Jean, my wife, and I were board members of a free dental clinic in Dawson County, Georgia. We were having a fundraiser and Barbara and Leon came up. So I just over, over, offhandedly asked him if he had any dental supply company contacts that might be willing to provide some sorely needed funds. He said, how much do you need? I replied, 1,500. He said, you mean 1,500 or 15,000? I, I wish I'd said 15,000. I, I replied that we needed 1,500. He said, oh, well, I can cover that myself. Uh, so uh, he was probably even considering the 15,000 uh, very seriously, but I think he was relieved that I wasn't hitting him up for any more. Just asking for advice, but so many people have benefited from his largesse. I truly love this man. We'll continue to do so. Y'all meet him again in Yahweh's glory. And we can share our friendship again. He certainly followed the words of Moses in Deuteronomy to love Yahweh and walk in his ways and keep his commandments and statutes and be blessed. And Leon was indeed blessed in so many ways. May we all continue to remember him in our hearts and our prayers. God full of mercy who dwells in the peace.
provide a sure rest from the wings of the divine presence within the range of the holy, pure, and glorious, who shine and resemble the skies to the soul of Ali, son of Zavidr. Therefore, the Master of Mercy will protect him forever, but behind the hiding of his wings, it will tie his soul with the rope of life. The everlasting is his heritage, and he shall rest peacefully on his lying place, and let us say, Amen. Thank you, Ronnie. Our next speaker is Dr. Joe Keneally. Like Ronnie, Joe's resume is also enormous, <laughs> but the key facts are, Joe's uh, from Kennebunk, Maine, in Fort Myers, Florida. He obtained his dental degree from Tufts University in 1981 and practiced dentistry in Biddeford, Maine from 1983 to 2019. He served in leadership roles with the Maine Dental Association for 30 years including as its president and served as vice president of the American Dental Association from 1997 to 1998. He has been the ADA liaison to the American Student Dental Association and remains very involved in mentorship of dental students. In 1995, Joe was inducted into the International College of Dentists, the world's premier dental fraternal organization, and served as its president in, 19, in 2014 and 2015. Since September 2020, he has served as Secretary General of the International College of Dentists. Joe and his wife, ICD fellow, Dr. Lisa Howard, remain active in many dental and community organizations. They have four kids and one grandchild. Please welcome Joe Keneally. Leon, I'm going to speak directly to you. Uh, first, thank you for nicknaming me Yas, because I know I'm in good with Snap, Zip, Scooter, and Yash. <laughs> I think you did rename most of the people you know in your life. Uh, I'm speaking directly to you because uh, I'm not mad or anything. I know you had a, a hard time with it toward the end there and you couldn't take visitors, but when I told you, don't let the last time I saw you all be the last time I see y'all. I'm sorry that it was true. Um, <clears throat> I do know that you're here. Uh, I think we all have felt it over the few days. Uh, we actually get a sign of it in golf. I was playing with your uh, your godson, uh, Michael Paderewski, and uh, your colleague and successor, Chris DeLeon, and we're struggling a little bit. We're on the 17th hole, and I hit my tee shot into the pond next to the alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Michael hit a better shot, but he's still in the fairway for par three. It didn't quite make it. It was a long par three. And then out of the drizzle we were playing in, the sun suddenly shone onto the tee box, and Michael stepped up and hit a glorious shot bounced just in front of the green, rolled up within just a few feet. And then the sun was shining on the green. And so we went up there and uh, Chris, who had told us the previous hole that he hadn't hit a putt all day, and I guess that was probably true, I wasn't really paying that much attention. Um, he invited one of us to hit it. Well, we weren't gonna touch that thing. <laughs> and, uh, and Chris stepped up and drained the putt. And we got the birdie that we thought we needed to be in the money. Of course, we missed that estimate by about six or seven strokes. Um, but but uh, Chris did look and say, thank you, Leah. So we do know that you're here. Um, I did bring a few things with me uh, in memory of Leon. Remembering that when Lisa and I used to travel for the ICD, um, we'd bring our two younger kids, uh, Lauren and Kevin. Virtually every time, wherever we were, one of them would be fiddling with a $50 bill. It's like their, their allowance was $5. <laughs> and where did you get that? Lauren would never tell us because 
she was told not to. But Kevin will always told the truth. Said Uncle Leon gave it to me. So, uh, Aronson kids, listen up. If you tell me a bunch of stuff about your hopes and dreams, where you want to go to college, um, I, I've got actually a, a bunch of crisp fifties in here. Well, all you got to do is fess up about whatever Leon will ask you. And then you get gas money. You're a little older than my kids were at the time. Um, um, you were always a, a very generous man. I think I probably owe you several thousand dollars in bar tabs picked up after American Dental Association or ICD meetings. Uh, you would always seem offended if I ever made an end run around the waitress or waiter to, to pay that bar tab. And you, how did you do that? But, Anyway, it's, I'm sure it's a few thousand dollars, so I've got a check to pay you back. <laughs> ICD Global Visionary Fund, which was started in 2013, your year as president. And uh, you'd be pleased to know that this year, that little fund gave away $3 million plus PPE to uh, charities around the world. And we had to get a little Leonish from time to time because <laughs> it's, it's hard to do good sometimes. And uh, getting a, a container to the Honduras is expensive and difficult, but there was a mission there. And uh, it turns out the Dole Banana Company ships bananas to the United States in containers full of them. Containers go back empty. And so you can fit a lot of masks and gloves and sanitizer and touchless thermometers and shields into a Dole Banana container for free. So uh, yeah, Leon would have appreciated that little bit of uh, innovation. Since they hired me as Secretary General, we've decided to, to rewrite the history of the ICD. And uh, we have a committee rewriting most of it, but I'm going to rewrite yours personally. Um, the, the things that you did in 2013 while you were fighting cancer were remarkable. You traveled everywhere, including Myanmar, which we can't get anyone into or out of now. We hear from them every now and then when they can get an email out. It's, it's not as it was, but one of the things that they tell us is remember them to Barbara Aronson. <laughs> your, your beloved little sparrow is lovely and caring as always. Wonderful travel companion, always had food for us, <laughs> always had hand sanitizer well before COVID, well before it became necessary or even fashionable. I, I don't know how you got that much hand sanitizer into your suitcases. That had to be a lot with four ounces of you know flammable alcohol-based gel. <laughs> but it came on an airplane somehow. It was, it was amazing. Um, Leon, you were a, a loving and devoted father to you your three daughters, but you gathered up your boys. Uh, a lot of us are here. We can't speak the name you gave us in the house of worship, but uh, we, we were it proudly. Uh, you know, you had a knack for making everybody feel like we were here. Sorry, I'm Irish, I cry. Um, <laughs> we were your best friend. Until I met Josh here was from the north. I thought I was your best Yankee friend. I might be that. But uh, you know, we, we were all better for that friendship. Um, Godspeed. Our next speaker is Dr. Eladio de Leon. Eladio is a graduate of the University of Kentucky, where he received his DMD in 1976. He completed his orthodontic residency training certificate and MS degree at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He retired at the rank of full colonel after serving 22 years in the U.S. Army Dental Corps. 
For the past 10 years and continuing today, he serves with the Orthodontic Certified Board as a Maritide Director and Consultant to the ABO Written Examination, and was one of Leon's great friends in Augusta for so many years and hosted Leon um, when Leon would go to teach. And he's become a great friend to me and the family. Um, Eladio, please come up. It's going to take me a few minutes to kind of calm down, but I have to say that I start out, I'm just humbled to be here in this beautiful synagogue that I heard every month we talk about. He loved the synagogue, he loved the rabbi, and I'm just absolutely honored to be here among his friends. You're always known by the friends you keep. And the time that we had yesterday, the fellowship at that golf course with all these wonderful guys, it just melted my heart away. And I'm not sure, Leon was like a brother. Leon was like a father. Leon was like an admiral. You know, he was the captain of the ship and he run a tight ship. And I don't want to deviate too much because he said the sparrow was really the admiral. And when she said, Wadia, would you speak on behalf at this special occasion? She said, keep it to three to five minutes. I took it serious, so I had to write it down. <laughs> Let me say some of the things you've heard already, but it just validates who Leon really was. So I consider it a distinct honor and privilege to be here. And I seriously thank Barbara and the family for the invitation to contribute to the celebration of life. These beautiful young women, his daughters, I feel like I know them because for 17 years he would share me all the ups and downs. <laughs> and so I really feel, and I can tell you, if you haven't had the chance to read his book, please read it because God, you feel like he's right next to you. And I couldn't be any more proud of the contributions he made to our university, formerly known as the Medical College of Georgia. It's now Augusta University. But let me say, this morning as I got dressed, this is Leon's tie. And I thought that was the most beautiful gesture that Barbara could ever do. But she gave me, as well as our residents, we all are wearing Leon's ties. And I, when I saw this this morning, I said, I've seen him wear it. <laughs> so I wear it here with pride when I put it around my neck. I really, I put it on a little tight so I was choking up when I think of more about Leon and how tight. So let me uh, say, I want to celebrate this kid from Puddleville. <laughs> I don't know if you read his book, what Puddleville means and how the word Adele came about. Adele, he, he was a giant of a man. He was a mountain of a man. And let me tell you real quickly, if you haven't read the book, his book, <laughs> please do so. But Piddle, Puddleville, Georgia was a real name. And they used to wipe their, their feet, as the story goes, on this burlap bag before they went to the general store. And the only thing that was that you could read from Philadelphia, some it was burlap that said Philadelphia cotton or some coffee was Adele. And Adele, Georgia, is where Leon, very humble background. He was larger than life. He was light up his room with his charismatic demeanor and smile. And Leon gave us a privilege. He lit up our department for 17 years at Augusta University. And the residents, let me tell you, the staff, the security lady that no one ever notices. We all love Leon. When Leon did come back, She'd ask me one day, where's the big guy with the money? Oh. And I said, you know, he had to retire. He's not feeling well, but he'll get well. But she loved Leon. 
because Leon's probably the only person in the building knew her name was Thelma because he would grill her just like we've said. <laughs> everything that's, I'm here to validate everything that's been done. So the, for, for the past 22 years, I've been had, had the honor of serving as a Marvin, Marvin C. Goldstein Chair of Orthodox. And Leon knew Marvin C. Goldstein. And he would give me that bear hug and he would tell me, Marvin would be so proud of you, Eladio, and you don't know what that meant to me. To get the bear hug from Leon and the validation from Leon made me, hey, I'm pretty old, I'm still kicking. But he felt like we had the best job. He loved orthodontics. And I'm here representing really the residents, our college, our university. And I think we meant a lot to Leon. He used to look forward to coming to see us. Leon was passionate. He was determined. He was intelligent. He was generous, inspiring. And as his, his partner would say, he was a practical, perfectionist. I mean, you had to dot the I's, cross the T's, but you know what? He could negotiate if we had to. He was just wonderful. And he had a way. I think he saved a lot of energy for the boys of the program because he had girls always. He was always guiding. He finally got to the point where he could guide some boys. And he loved to watch talk football, talk sports. He could go anywhere, anytime with those guys. I worried a little bit sometimes with the ladies in the program. <laughs> I said, Leon, you're gonna get me fired. We can't treat ladies like we did in the 1950s. So. He would call them a nurse. They're really doctors. Come on, Leon. I said, <laughs> he said, the little blonde. I said, what about the little brunette over here? Amir, I'd call the boy brunette. I said, you get the. <laughs> He'd give me a hug and, and a, a smile. He could get away with anything. You know, it's just like, if I did some of the things Leon, I'd be probably out of here by now, but Leon had a way. He never met a stranger, whether it was a waitress, just like you've mentioned. And I was always some, sometimes embarrassed by some of the questions that he would ask. I said, Leon, kick him under the table. <laughs> you know, He'd strike up a conversation and he would listen intently. He wasn't superficial. He'd heard what you said. He would ask questions and he was really truly interested in the replies. Leon was a kind soul. And it's amazing how these people, like the waitress, would share this stuff with them. They're like this flow. I, I couldn't get anybody to flow that well. But Leon would make them feel like they were very important at that moment. And we got good service. We always did. Where he used to like to go, Honey on the Rock. It was a religious baseball place in Honey on the Rock. He broke every rule that Barbara the Sparrow would send him. He was always on a diet. He would not. He said he was not supposed to eat desserts, but he did all of that in Augusta, just so that you know. <laughs> because uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But interesting. I first met Leon. In Savannah Dental Society meeting in 1977. I was a young officer at Hunter Army Airfield. And I was interested in going to orthodontics, but I owned the military some time. So I made it a point to meet Leon because Leon was new in his practice. And I had the opportunity to meet Leon. I can remember where he practiced right there off of Paulson, I think it was. So it was a treat. Then interesting, 23 years later, our paths crossed again. In, 19, in 2000, in the year 2000, when Jimmy High, a loyal and dedicated faculty member from our department, he's from Statesboro, approached me about Leon's retirement from his private practice. Dr. High's comment was, a lot of them, let's recruit him. We want him to join our team. Well, I reviewed his CV and I said, we'll be lucky if we can get him to accept our offer join our team. One could only wonder how Leon had the energy and the time to serve on so many incredible number of prestigious organizations, everything from Savannah to Georgia to the, to the world, everything. I said, it's probably not going to happen. But let me repeat something that's been brought up because something that was, of all the things on this CD, too many to mention, I will mention one. 
because the residents would refer to Leon as president of the world. That's pretty, I was chair of the department, but he was president of the world. And that started in 1991. And I know we had the ICD represented here and I thank you, Joe, for being, because he loved that organization. And that's the only organization on the CB I'll bring up. It started when Leon was awarded the press, it's a prestigious title of fellow International College of Dentists. Like it was said, it's a global organization of 122 countries. They each have presidents. And the invitation is only, I mean, membership is by invitation. You have to really prove to be a nominated dentist. You have to have a, a rather outstanding record, achievement, meritorious service, dedication to the continued progress of dentistry for the benefit of humankind. And I, I, and I know you all know, Leon would not hesitate to donate when he had to for, for the cause of this. And he loved this organization. Leon's passion, dedication, and service to this organization led him to be named president of the International College in 2006. Therefore, the residents called him president of the world. And he was really the boss. Every time he came in, he knew who the boss was in that department. And he and Barbara traveled the world to promote the universal International College of Dentistry model, which recognizing service and the opportunity to serve. Well, we were lucky. Leon enjoyed his retirement for 10 months before joining our department in November 2000. And sadly, he retired January 2017. And I can tell you that was one of the saddest days. I did not. He kept saying he was a dinosaur. I said, Leon, we need dinosaurs. You know, he said, no, I don't know, I have to take care of well, just recently, the, the, the man that introduced me to Leon, to the department, Jimmy High, called me Thursday, tell me he retired. It's breaking my heart to see the best guys in the department, you know, go away. So, you know, he was just incredible. We were lucky. He came and joined us. And during the 17 years, he would travel monthly to Augusta and stay in our home Sunday evening. I remember the first trip he took, I think he left at five o'clock in the morning to be there by eight o'clock. And I think, you know, as a dad, I worry when people I love are on the road. And I said, there's no way that I can let Leon drive in the morning to be here at eight o'clock. So we invited him to our home and Dottie was so gracious and our kids. And we he put him in, he felt like he was bunking in the boys room. <laughs> You love that big fish that Chris had on the wall. And he became part of the family. He put, brought his flip flop to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, he, uh, we, would, we would do the same thing every Sunday. He was, he said, well, you know, he called me up from Milledgeville because it just stopped at the Dairy Queen. <laughs> he said, you know what, Lyle, we, I'm on a diet. And I said, well, let's do a good plan when you get here. We'll go out to eat. Next thing you know, I get, when he gets to Bobby Jones Expressway, we end up meeting close at the restaurant uh, Longhorns. We go to Longhorns. We meet at Longhorns and we start ordering. I think he's going to get a salad. He gets a renegade, the 16 ounce steak. <laughs> so we, we make it big. I said, well, we won't even get dessert here. We just go back home. And Dottie would always have dessert, cookies or cake. And I found out Leon loved ice cream. In fact, he would take a spoon right into the bowl and grab it. All right. Dottie would make a dessert. Then we would go into family history. I'd know about Amy. Always started with Amy. Always started with Amy. Then we went to Linda. And then we went to Hay. We had just a word for And then after that, was Sunday night football or whatever. And he loved watching with the boys. So he had a tremendous impact, not only on our residents, but well, also on my own family, and we're forever grateful for the impact he had. He was a wonderful mentor. He was a role model, and I'll always thank him for that. Leon was always eager to share his years of experience, his wisdom to his beloved residents. Leon would always revel, which is interesting, in their success and accomplishment. And he would remain loyal to them even after graduation. 
I can tell you, I had faculty members at times who would almost be jealous that the residents are doing so well. Leon was the opposite. He wanted to see people around him to succeed. He loved these guys. And he'd be thrilled to see him in the chair right now, right now, and as successful they are. So it's unbelievable. Leon did achieve an incredible and impressive CD. But he would humbly knew his achievements could not have been achieved without the support of his beautiful wife, Barbara, and his loving daughters, Amy, Linda, and Hedy. I mean, we heard about you guys and the grandkids. That's all he would talk about. And then once after dessert, it was Sunday night football. And after dessert and the renegade, about halftime, I'd say, Dottie, what about popcorn? Leon said, no, no popcorn. I'm OK. Dottie would make the popcorn anyway. And guess what? Polish off a bowl. <laughs> he would polish off that popcorn before he goes down. Above all else, family and faith were the driving force, and he dearly loved his family. But he saved his incomprehensible love for the woman who stole his heart in October 1959, when she walked into the Emory cafeteria at Cox Hall. You remember that there, Barbara? And they later married in December 1961. Leon always, as you heard, referred to Barbara as his little sparrow. He was always telling me, watch out for the little sparrow. <laughs> I'm buying her a car today, Eladio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Leon was a remarkable human being. He was esteemed by his professional colleagues, loved by his family, cherished by his friends. He was a world-class orthodox. He once told me that he loved his life as an orthodox, and he felt it was critically important to get back to his beloved profession. And Leon did. No one gave back as much. He would love going to St. Louis. He would love coming up to our program. As a result, Leon made our program better. Not only our program, but our specialty better. And he is sorely missed. There's not too many Monday mornings that I don't miss Leon because I said he should be here. And I'll conclude with this. At several graduations, Leon would recite and conclude with a very special poem to the residents. If you have the time, if you've never, I have printed out a few, a dozen, right under the computer to read this poem. Because when I read this poem, I feel like Leon is right next to me. In the poem, the name is The Man in the Glass, written by Peter Dale Winrow Sr. And Leon personified this poem, for Leon never cheated the man in the glass. And the poem, if you're interested, is right there. It's worth reading. So Barbara, once again, I thank you for the privilege. I consider it a privilege. I love Leon like a brother, like a father. Like the lion that he was, he, I miss him lighting up the room. But I truly believe he was with us yesterday and he's he with us last night and here with me today. The little rainstorm that came from one hole was Leon just kind of jabbing at us. He knew we we're the oldest guys on the, we had, we had 345 years in our foursome and we never had a better time. So, Barbara, thank you and may God. Continue to bless you and your family, the Aronson family. Thank you so much for the honor of wearing this tie. Thank you, Eladio. Our next speaker is Dr. Mark Causey. Mark is a board certified orthodontist who practices in Cumming, Georgia. He's married to his wife for 16 years and they have four kids. Graduated dental school at the Medical College of Georgia in 2010 and received his orthodontic certificate from the Medical College of Georgia Department of Orthodontics in 2012. He currently serves as part-time faculty in the Department of Orthodontics at Augusta University and serves as the dentist for the Atlanta Falcons. He was nationally recognized for his work with 3D printed masks during the pandemic, 
and holds several provisional patents pertaining to 3D printing. He is a member of numerous dental organizations and the Rotary Club of Foresight. And most importantly, he has been the orthodontist to all three of my kids, whose teeth are sensationally straight. And he's become a good friend to me and our family. Please welcome Mark Cousin. When Dr. De Leon said he was only going to speak for three to five minutes, I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and for the record, the bug zapper over the buffet in North Georgia, that's my family's restaurant. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if I ask people in this room uh, how many people had actually changed the course of their life, it would probably be less than five people in your life. And Dr. Aronson was one of those people in my life. Uh, he, was, he was special. I had the honor of studying orthodontics at the Medical College of Georgia under him for several years. And uh, there was much to be learned about orthodontics from him. And I learned a ton. But his expertise and his emphasis was always on people. And you've heard this before. It was patients. It was staff members. It was community. And most importantly, it was family. And he would emphasize those things. And he was special. I think we would all agree. Uh, he was the type of special that would only come around a couple of times in your lifetime. And so every time he came around, I was that annoying kid that would ask him 100 questions every time I saw him. And I would copy everything he did, except for his tassel shoes and his mustache. <laughs> in a room full of people, he was the antidote for apathy for awkwardness, you know, for doubt, all these things. His leadership, his confidence were just magnetic. And, and I wanted it, you know, I think we all wanted what he had uh, and we admired it. And there are a few things that I'd like to share with you guys today that I learned from watching him that we can all use in today's world. Number one, connect. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not talking about social media posts. I'm not talking about small talk. You've heard it before. Find depth in conversations. Uh, find that depth. Listen to people. Dr. Aronson was the best I think I've ever seen. In life. The best. And I'm not lying when I say this. I've seen it before. He could talk to a waitress in the Waffle House about her teeth. <laughs> now think about that. You know? And she would be willing to share. People want to tell their stories and you need to listen to those stories. And don't be afraid to ask the right questions. I learned those things from you. So connect. The second thing that I want to talk about is have the confidence to bet on yourself. I, I think we all doubt ourselves sometimes and he would reinforce that. About a year before you finish residency, you scramble to find the right position on where you're going to land, where you're going to raise your family, where you're going to start a practice. And I couldn't quite find the right fit. I was looking and I wanted to join a practice. There wasn't really the right availability. And, and I remember I was standing inside the clinic and, you know, he, he'd grab you if he had something to tell to you. He pulled me in this little room. And it was funny, the rabbi said it, and Dr. DeLeon used this analogy and he said, Mark, you need to be captain of your own ship. He said, you need to start your own practice. And of course, at the time, you, you doubt yourself and you come up with excuses in your mind and you say, you know, the economy's not good. I've got student debt. Nobody does that anymore. You know, all these things. And he wouldn't accept that as an answer. I remember he constantly hounded me. Mark, you got to have the confidence to start, start your own thing. And so he assured me, he said, I'll be there for you. I'll be, I'll be the one to guide you through this whole process. I'll be your confidence throughout this process. And so a year later, I started my own practice. I was, you know, there, I was captain of my own ship. It was nerve wracking. If you've ever started a business, especially in orthodontics, that first year rolled around and I'll never forget, 
you know, I, I would go out there and I'd have like three patients in a day. And a busy orthodontic office can be 70 to 100 plus patients a day. And I called him and I said, Dr. Aronson, I said, I said, there's like three patients on my schedule today. I know when people come in, they've got to be looking. It's like that restaurant that you walk into and you realize nobody's eating there and you, you immediately realize it was a mistake and you fake that phone call. Like, yeah, is that an emergency? I, <laughs> I got to grab the family and come on out. We laugh, and, you know, and he assured me it was part of that process. And so we sat and we laughed about it and we talked for a while. And so finally we came up with this plan. I'll just schedule all three patients at the same time. You know? And so we I would go out and, and I'd go get a patient. I'd bring them back. And the other patients were sitting there. Mind you, I had eight hours on my schedule that day. <laughs> so I grab one, I go get the other, and I'd say, you know what? I apologize for the wait. Just busy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll get to it. But but it was moments like that that he just, you know, he, he would guide me. And, and here I am, I'm nine plus years in a huge practice. And, you know, I'm, I'm captain of my own ship and she's still afloat. And he gave me that confidence to, to bet on myself, you know. And that's something we all need to remember. And it's hard to do sometimes. Uh, thirdly and lastly, um, this is something that everyone can do. And, uh, it's unconditional generosity always wins. Unconditional. And there's generosity out there with expectations of receiving back what you've given. But it was, it was he that kind of emphasized that to us and expressed generosity with your staff members, with your family, with your community, with your patients. As an orthodontist, you have an obligation to give back certain cases for free. And he constantly would, would emphasize that to us. And I remember I went to a conference where I listened to a consultant, you know, orthodontist, we have a consultant for everything except for changing the toilet paper roll in the bathroom. Uh, and I said, Dr. Anderson, I called him. I said, Dr. Anderson, I said, I listened to this consultant. And he said, never give a case away for free. Like at least charge your expenses. Or if you do take a case for free, have them hold up a big check. You know, it's great marketing. And, and, you know, I remember I called him, I told him about this. We were kind of venting to each other. I think his mustache caught on fire <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> you know, and, and he, he emphasized again, he, he said, Mark, you know, I, I can't express this enough. You know, unconditional generosity is, is something that you need to do. And, and, and we went through that. And, and today I, I take on many cases for free because of him. You know, I live by the motto, and he used to tell me this all the time. The only people that have to know are you and the man upstairs. And, and I try to live by that motto and, and do those things. So I'm honored to be here. And today we celebrate my mentor, my friend, my teacher, and most importantly, um, a man that changed the course of my life. So thank you all. Good morning, everyone. I am the other son-in-law, married to Linda. Um, I'm Bruce Sarkeesian. And um, one of the first things that uh, I, I met Josh and Eddie before I met Leon. And we, I'll never forget this, we, we went out to dinner and Josh scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> said that. Uh, anyway, he, he told me about his interview his inquisition with Leon and I thought oh boy I'm really in for it so uh the next week I think uh Barbara and Leon came to Atlanta and I was polished up I wore my, my best clothes I cleaned my car it was everything was looking perfect and I thought okay I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get it but he could not have been nicer and kinder and um I just felt like Okay, I, 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 I guess I got him after he retired. And so that's how he had already started mellowing with me. And from that, from that night forward, I always felt like I belonged. And that was the thing 
that Leon gave me the most was that feeling of, of belonging. Um, it felt so nice to be embraced by him, to be under his umbrella. Whenever we went anywhere, you know, he would introduce me as his son-in-law, you know, he's with me. And, and immediately there was a bond between me and, and you know, his, his business partners or his friends or whoever we were playing golf with. And I felt like, you know, I, I was a member of the club. I had gotten the, the key to the secret room where all the fun was being had. So it was just such a wonderful feeling. Um, my father passed away shortly after Linda and I got married. And I felt like, you know, Leon took me in and he took my children in. I had children from a previous marriage and, you know, they were his grandkids too. Um, and it just was so special. And uh, the thing that, that brought it home to me most was when we went to um, Israel in 2019. And, and Rabbi, I didn't know if you knew this, but I'm not Jewish. I, he always, that was our little secret. Um, he said, don't tell the rabbi. So, um, I hope I'm not revealing any secrets here. Uh, but I'm, an, I'm an, of Armenian heritage. And he made sure that, um, you know, we went to the Armenian quarter in Jerusalem. We're very proud that we have a quarter in the old city. And that when we went to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, that we we saw the Armenian section of it, and it was just, you know, he said, you're one of us, this is your place, you belong. And um, that was just very special, and it was it was so nice to be his son-in-law, and, you know, um, we just, we loved him so much, we miss him so much, we think of him all the time. We take a piece of him wherever we go. I, I've got his tie on, I've got his shirts on my head. <laughs> Um, I've got his pocket square in my pocket. You know, I always try and take a, a little piece of Leon with me wherever I go. Um, so now I would like to um, introduce uh, cousin Mark Aronson. He's representing the Leon's siblings. Um, and Mark is joining us from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So Mark, come on up. So uh, I want to thank Barbara for uh, allowing us this morning to come and celebrate. Uh, so good to see everyone. I, I don't get to come to Savannah uh, very often. And uh, I felt fortunate about two years ago, I happened to be in town and uh, Barbara and Leon happened to be in town. And that's uh, also something rare. And so, <laughs> We were able to uh, visit with Leon. Uh, and as I look back at the past uh, two years, year and a half, two years, that was one of the bright spots that I got to see him that weekend uh, prior, uh, before the pandemic and everything else. And uh, yeah, I'm here representing the brothers and sisters of Leon. Uh, who couldn't be here, uh, it was a difficult year. Uh, losing Leon, losing my sister, losing Uncle Sam, who brought uh, joy and laughter everywhere he went. And it's just so great to be here uh, this morning. Uh, my parents had planned to come. Uh, we uh, had a practice run of going to Savannah, otherwise known as a hurricane evacuation. For mm -hmm. Hurricane Ida. And we realized at that time that the travel would be too difficult, but they did send me with some words uh, for, for you today. So, dear Barbara, we are so disappointed we cannot join family in paying tribute to Leon. We want to share a few thoughts as to how much Leon meant to us. Leon prided himself for living us up, for setting us up for our first Day to a dance at Emory. What a match. And a first for all of us South Georgians driving up to the snowy mountains of West Virginia for your wedding. We are left with so many more memories of the laughter and joy Leon exuded in his charismatic and caring personality and especially devotion to family. You and Leon have been there for us in so many ways. 
Leon's big heart and great accomplishments exemplify a great man. This saying truly applies to him. A beautiful soul is never forgotten. With love, Mitzi and Ben. I also am here uh, to read uh, remarks from uh, Rosalie and Jerry Bogo. And if you're a member of the Aronson family, then you know that Barbara and Leon and Rosalie and Jerry came to every event, every event of mine in my life, my kids' events. They're just wonderful family members. So I know that Rosalie and Jerry would have loved to have been here. And as I read these words in her voice, I want you to picture a beautiful woman, okay? Because uh, these are beautiful words. I know, who, I know there will be others who speak today about Leon. And so I will stick to the Aronson family remarks. I know the words distinguish, handsome, mentor, friend, advisor, and more superlatives will be said of him. I will speak of him as my brother. This has been a, a sad past two years. I lost two brothers in one year. Leon, who deserved the biggest celebration of life, only had a family burial. For Brother Sam, we were able to have a small service for my family of siblings. We are now at two. Today, Leon gets what he deserves, a celebration for family and friends to express their love of him. He was a giant of a man who touched many. Harold and Pauline Aronson were our parents. Our father came from Lithuania at age 17, and my mom came to America from Germany when she, when she was three. They met and married in Savannah and had our sister Phyllis and brothers Sam and Ben in Lumber City, Georgia. Leah and I were born in Adel, Georgia. One of my regrets is that I do not know much of the history of our parents. I think we were just too young to realize their history would be so important to us as we age. In the, in, as we age. In the last few years of Leon's life, he began a quest to find out with the help of the, his son-in-law, Josh, he, uh, he, with the help of his son-in-law, Josh, he, he passed away before much was found out. He always stayed in touch with cousins and really loved our family and the stories he heard. Our family had a clothing store as many of the Jews in small towns had. Our dad demanded that we be at the store after school and on Saturdays. As Leon became a teenager, he would hang out at the pool hall on the other side of the back alley. When our dad was away, he never knew when daddy would return. Daddy would pull up his white Cadillac up to the back of the store and one of the clerks would run to get Leon from the pool. <laughs> Leon had many friends and did very well in school. He cherished his friends from his childhood. He remained in touch with many until his last days. Hayden Davis is here in one of, one of them. I don't remember him being into sports, although he wrote in his book that he played basketball and that ended when he rang the wrong goal. <laughs> he was the statistician of the football team, a pitcher for the baseball team. He was voted friendliest as a senior superlative. He carried that title all his life that we can agree. We went to synagogue in Fitzgerald, Georgia, mostly for the Jewish holidays, but also for Sunday school. Leon was not more mitzvah when a teenager, but he was late in later years in Israel. A few years ago, he took his whole family to Fitzgerald for the holidays to share the experience with them. It was always a surprise that a person with such little knowledge of our religion would become president of his synagogue, his Orthodox synagogue. He always had a quest for knowledge and being Jewish was very important to him. I too became a president of my synagogue in Naples. And one of the first things Leon would always ask me is, Bud, how is your Yiddish kite? <laughs> he called me Bud short for Rosebud, only person who called me that. 
Leon was a good soul, a Jita Nishan, thoughtful and loving. Leon and Barb had settled in Savannah and eventually our parents had moved there. Daddy passed away and mama lived in a little apartment on Reynolds Street. Every morning, Leon came to mama's apartment for breakfast. He could check on her and give her something to look forward to. Leon and Barbara looked after our parents as did Ben and Mitzi, who also lived in Savannah. When anyone had a hardship and needed help, Leon was the first one there. Our family was close and as Leon said, we leaned on each other. <coughs> Leon loved golf and loved to play with my husband, Jerry. One of the nicest things he said to me was that he regarded Jerry as a brother and not, and not a brother-in-law. Leon loved his family and was a wonderful husband and father. He wrote his memoirs to give to his kids on his 70th birthday. I guess having no knowledge of our parents and their family inspired him to do this. There was a sequel to the first one, and I would love to have seen his next one. In the past few years, we have we always waited for the report from MD Anderson upon his return from a checkup. He kept a positive outlook throughout. On April 10th, I received a note from Leon's girls that he had had enough. On April 11th, I received a note from Leon Trey. Did not know if you know, I am in hospice house, latest. No more Houston, no more treatment. I came to hospice yesterday upon advice of the doctor. Great care and grit. My reply, which I asked to be read to him if he did not read it was, yes, we found out yesterday and can understand that your comfort is of utmost importance after your long bath. Hospice will take care of you and your little sparrow will see to that. You have put forth a valiant fight against a terrible sickness and now you need to be at peace. You have a family who loves you dearly as do we siblings of yours and other family. You have been a part of a caring family and you've taken the lead in much of it. We are so proud of all your accomplishments. You are a good soul in all ways. We will continue to pray for your comfort, peace, and no pain. With much love, your wonderful brother, Rosalie, your, your wonderful brother, Rosalie, and brother, Jerry, your wonderful sister, Rosalie, and brother, Jerry. So to our family, Leon was loving, kind, thoughtful, caring, generous, humorous, a real kibitzer. We miss all of that. Thank you. Okay, well, next up, you are about to be regaled by Steve Urell, who we affectionately refer to as Cousin Stevie, and he is representing Barbara's side of the family from Columbus, Ohio. I'm under strict orders to be short and sweet. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, for those who <clears throat> don't know who I am, I'm Stevie Urell. My mother, Gloria, and Barbara are sisters. I noticed, Aunt Barbara, on your invitation that you wanted us to come together to celebrate the life of a great man, a great friend, brother, husband, father, and grandfather. I want to add to that list a terrific uncle. When I was a boy, Uncle Leon would take my brother and I on secret missions. <laughs> he would pump, in, pump us up with his, what I call, mischievous enthusiasm. And he would create the anticipation that we were truly going on a special mission. Never mind that the highlight of that trip was to go buy boiled peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there was no real mission, but there was adventure. Just being with Uncle Leon 
was an adventure. And we were always thrilled to be with him. Leon was a very loving and supportive uncle. He would always ask me how I was doing. When he came to town, he would come to my place of business and he would gleefully declare he was here to check out my empire. <laughs> he always made you feel bigger and better than you actually are. Through all of his joking and constant ribbing, you knew that he genuinely cared about you. When I first started out at college <laughs> as a stockbroker, he was one of the first people to send me money to invest. Way back then, when I ventured into real estate, it was Uncle Leon that lent me the money to buy my first property. I mean, the guy was like a father to me. When you're un when you're young and unproven and very few people believe in you, it's difficult. After my parents, I would always turn to Uncle Leon. I cannot overstate the significance of having someone like that in your life. And he's touched us all this way. He's generous, fun-loving, supportive, and it just is the absolute one of the lucky breaks of my life to have him as my uncle. To me, he's always been a giant for me. His joy for life was so infectious and truly inspirational. And he led an exemplary life. And that has been a guiding light for me. And I aspire to be just like him. A great friend, brother, husband, father, grandfather, and uncle. To Aunt Barbara, Amy, Linda, Hetty, I love you. And I speak for all of your else when I say, we want to be there for you, like Uncle Lena has always been there for us. Thank you. And now I would like to uh, bring up Barbara Leon's oldest daughter, Amy. Um, I think Amy shared uh, a lion-like quality of Leon in her fierceness, and she didn't share her, her resume with me, but um, she's made so many accomplishments in the world of academia, and I know how proud Leon was of everyone. So, Dr. Amy Aronson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I dreaded this day. Um, so many of my comments have already been addressed by many of you, but I'm going to stick to my script and tell you who my father, Erwin Leon Aronson, was and what he meant to me. Erwin Leon Aronson, also known to his family and close friends as Ish, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing this, but I'm going to tell you where the word Ish is from the Hebrew and translated into English as man or the man. And indeed, Leon Aronson was quite the man. Ish was many things to many people. As we gather here today to honor his life and legacy of Leon, my father, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you who he was for me. Ish was a professional, as has been attested to, and also served as a role model for me to pursue uh, my dreams and academic ambitions, and he was always very supportive of that. And let's talk about him a little bit as Dr. Aronson. The well-known and popular orthodontist was admired and well-respected within the local, state, as well as international dental communities, as you know. And to attest to his popularity, again, another story, I recall as a child, our regular weekend strolls down the beach at Tybee and a simple walk up and down the beach, which would normally take an hour or so 
turned into an all-day social and happy hour, as he would be greeted by an onslaught of patients who would gather around and allow him to check out their bite. <laughs> Along with this dental check came lots of schmoozing and getting to know the particular patient's family and friends accompanying them on the beach that day. As the stroll continued, there was usually a stop to greet a fellow Tybean or a friend and refresh his drink and share some boiled peanuts, one of our favorites, and needless to say, he didn't meet the stranger. As everyone has also attested to, Ish was generally interested in people and had a way of making everyone feel special and valued, especially me. Ish the philanthropist. He donated generously to a variety of organizations, the synagogue, the federation, the JEA, dental societies, alma maters, Savannah's sister city in Israel, not to mention his own family and complete strangers. I recall my parents' trip to Vietnam and Cambodia, where they came across a young girl wanting to go to college, but was not able to due to its cost. Each stepped up to the plate and made it happen, sending her funds for her tuition in return for updates on her progress at school. Each not only helped to improve the life of others, um, of his loved ones, but also a complete stranger. In a world full of takers, Ish was a giver, a true mensch. Ish the family man. Ish was an exceptional son, brother, son-in-law, uncle, husband, father, and grandfather. Not only was he exceptional father to me, but he was also my best friend, my mentor, my fan, my cheerleader, and my rock. I would like to share with you some childhood memories that attest to Isha's commitment to family and fatherhood. As uh, Mark just mentioned from Aunt Rosalie's um, words, dad was a loving son to his mother, Polly, and he would always go to her apartment in the early morning on his way to work um, to have breakfast with her. As a senior bound to her home most of the time, this small act of kindness made her day um, and I also recall Sunday summer dinners at William Seafood, a family favorite. And after a long hot day on the beach, we would go there Sunday night dinner with the family, Mark's family as well. And each would always make sure that Nana got her favorite fish, which was fried flounder. And if it wasn't cooked right, each would send it back and make sure it was prepared to her liking because he wanted to see her happy. Another memory of growing up at Tybee in the summers was begging each to make his famous fudge. Ish was not a cook, and as B.B. can attest, he did not know where anything was in the kitchen, but he could make some serious fudge. So imagine an orthodontist who makes fudge. We would get him to make it, and we would enjoy it so much, and at the end of that indulgence, he would always remind us to go brush our teeth uh, immediately after eating. As a child, Ish would spend a lot of time with me, in spite of his busy schedule. I remember him driving me to school one cold winter day to help me set up a science project before going to his office and seeing the full schedule of patients. As a student at the Hebrew Day School, learning about the Jewish holidays, Ish built me a sukkah one year. I remember him staying up late that night after I had gone to bed building that sukkah. When I woke up the next day, I was so excited. I decorated it with hanging fruit and pine straw on the roof and put a chair and a table in it to eat my meals. It was so cute. It stood standing just long enough to celebrate the holiday and then it collapsed. <laughs> Fish may not have been a carpenter, but the gesture and memory are everlasting. In the summer, each would take me fishing and crabbing at Little Tybee, a Little Tybee watering hole. But the only thing we ever caught were nasty bullfrogs. We never caught any fish. Um, but it was sure a great day just being with dad. I remember not being very happy at school as a child. My only interest was horses. And I would just mope around and be sad. I wasn't at the stable having a lesson or spending the summer at horse camp. One night at dinner, each asked me point blank. He said, Amy, what is it going to take to make you happy? I said, a horse. <laughs> so each made it happen and got me that horse. That horse saved my life growing up. I've been into horses ever since and horse happiness. And thanks to Ish and Bibi for doing that for me.
So then once Ish got me the horse, he probably thought, okay, I'm done with that problem solved. <laughs> Little did he know, the horse shows, the clothes, the trailer. Um, I remember how after working all weekend before I could drive, Ish would get up early on the weekends to schlep me the horse shows all over God's green earth. Um, so that I could be proud by winning a ribbon or a trophy. Well, that's probably the last thing he wanted to do on his day off was to hook up the trailer and load the horse and drive me all over the state of Georgia with the heat, the flies, and the horse poop. And he did it, and he did it happily. It made him happy that I was happy, and I was happy to have him all to myself and win a trophy or ribbon in his presence. Um, then there were the family ski trips to Colorado. And as you all know, each had a great sense of humor. One day skiing, each took a really nasty fall <laughs> and landed on his tailbone, or his coccyx, as he called it. <laughs> Once he righted himself up and adjusted his clothing and equipment and did damage control, he shouted out, I just found my coccyx in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's the devil, what's he doing here? <laughs> and we all burst out laughing. <laughs> After hitting the slopes all day, everyone else would be tired and, and go early to bed, but not Ish and I. Uh -uh. He, would hit, he and I would hit the cowboy, board, cowboy bars after dinner and dance the night away. Even in Savannah, Ish and I would cut a rug, and everyone thought, what a great looking couple. A little bit, they know he was my father. I was so proud to have a daddy daughter my now. Then there were the special family outings to each his favorite restaurants in Savannah. Garibaldi's, the Chatham Club, where he and I would start off with a scotch on the rocks and end with a dram buoy straight up. We were not only dancing partners, but drinking buddies as well. I sometimes feel that I may have been the female version of the son he never had. On a more serious note, I'll never forget Ish and mom driving me to Philadelphia to walk down the aisle to receive my doctorate degree while undergoing treatment for lymphoma. When I was diagnosed, diagnosed, Ish went to synagogue to the synagogue every day to pray for me and my healing and recovery. He would proudly wear his Temple Owls t-shirt and tell everyone that he had a daughter who was a doctor. There are so many wonderful stories to tell about each, the professional, the father, the family man, but my time is limited here, so let me conclude. Ish was a fighter. When Ish was first diagnosed, I could not believe it. Fear and dread washed over me. I never could imagine life without my parents. I thought that when that day came, I would just wither up and crumble. For 11 years, Ish stayed off the cancer doing whatever it took in order to stay with us for as long as possible. As much as we all prayed for Ish to be with us forever, and despite his fight, Ish was tired. While he had come to terms with the prognosis and ultimate outcome and was ready to meet his maker, we of course did not want to let him go. As much as I wanted Ish to stay with us, I would be eternally grateful that I was able to be by his bedside during those final days to take care of him and hold his hand and to tell him how much he was loved. What a blessing Hashem bestowed upon me to be there for Ish at the end of his physical life as Ish had always been there for me during my life. I stand before all of you today to tell you what you already know, otherwise you would not be here. My father, Erwin Leon Aronson, was the Ish, a true mensch. They do not make him, them like him anymore. In a world full of mediocrity, each was an exception. While my world is much smaller and lonelier place without each in it, I know that he is with me in spirit and is watching over me. May we all hold dad, each, Leon, dear to our hearts and in our memories forever. Amen. I have the pleasure of introducing my wife, Linda Aronson Sarkeesian. Uh, she's Leon's middle daughter. And um, I just want to say that 
He also was so proud of her. He called her Lindis. He also <laughs> called her the sage. And um, after we raised our children, Linda went back to school um, and got her master's degree in, in counseling. And um, she basically made straight A's and she would, he, Leon would always ask her, how's school, how are you doing? And she proudly said how well she was doing. And he was just so proud of the woman she is and the woman she became. And here's Linda. <laughs> There is power in a man, in his form, in his voice, in the boundless legacy he leaves through his children. That's my dad. So where do I begin with such limited time to express the deep well of my love, respect, and gratitude to the most courageous and generous man I have ever known, my father, known affectionately as Ish, my family and dear friends. I cannot express enough the gratitude I feel that we are gathered together here today for the sole purpose of celebrating and remembering the life of Ish. 18 months ago, assembling together to mourn the loss of this most exceptional, one of a kind human being and supporting one another through our collective and individual grief was not possible, which makes today all the sweeter. My father and I had a complicated relationship. We are both strong personalities and did not always see eye to eye. Though as the years unfolded and we both matured and became more sensitive and accepting of the unique and individual perspectives of one another, a deep appreciation and mutual respect emerged. Dad was a problem solver. He wanted his loved ones to be happy, at ease, to enjoy the precious gift of life. When life presented challenges my way, dad stepped in to offer counsel and support. He would brainstorm with me, make suggestions, and inquire as to how he could lighten my burden. During my years of suffering, it pained him when he could not take away the sorrow. And yet he offered a steadfast presence, which provided me with great comfort. Very importantly, I knew he had my back and I could rest in the security of that truth. And I did and I do. My father cared deeply for his family, often quoting the adage, there's nothing like family. He made sure that his wife, affectionately known as baby, his children, his beloved grandchildren, knew that it is family that matters most in life. Nonetheless, he offered his love, care, talents, resources, and time to extended family, friends, the synagogue, his work, both with patients and colleagues, as well as the dental community worldwide. To those who have been blessed to cross the path of my father, their lives have ever been enriched. I am blessed with many memories, and I have, as I have shared, hold feelings of being cared for, appreciated, and respected by my father. He was with me during the first days of my life, and I was with him during his last. Dad demonstrated amazing courage as he endured with minimum complaint the journey of cancer. When I lamented the cruelty of this illness and expressed the injustice about why my father, a non-smoker, was afflicted with lung cancer, his response was, why not me? He understood that suffering was part of the human experience. He was grateful for the beautiful life he had been able to create for his family. He did not let cancer define him. Instead, he continued forging his path. And with my mother at his side, they navigated the challenge together. And their love forging strong with every precious day. Our family was gifted with years beyond the initial prognosis, and for that, we are most grateful. Nothing was left unsaid. Dad knew he was cherished and deeply loved. 
and I knew that he cherished and loved me deeply. At his bedside during the last days, he told stories of his childhood. We reminisced about family trips together in the good old days. I asked for forgiveness for my teenage rebellion. And dad said to me, what are you talking about? As though I had always been the daughter he was so deeply proud of during our last hours together. The final time we would spend together with dad coherent and in between resting periods, I sat in a chair nearby and he looked at me thoughtfully and intently and then gently wiped a tear from his eye. That beautiful moment is forever etched in my heart and my soul and my mind. And I'm gonna close by reading a poem that I believe captures our new reality of living on earth without the physical presence of our beloved Ish. It's a poem by Maya Angelou and it's called When Great Trees Fall. When great trees fall, Rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly, see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them leaves, takes leave of us. Our souls dependent upon their nurture now shrink, wizened. Our minds formed and informed by their radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms. Slowly and always irregularly, spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restore, never to be the same. Whisper to us, they existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better for they existed. Thank you. Last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce my wife, Hetty, and Mrs. Marks, my baby daughter, and incredible wife and mother of our three kids. Um, so much I could say about her, but I'm gonna let you listen to her words about the dad. Thank How strange it is to be standing here honoring my dad a year and a half after he passed. But in a way it is suiting as Leon Aronson was far from ordinary as you've heard over and over again. In fact, he was quite extraordinary and worthy of honoring no matter the circumstances. Thank you all for being here both in person and virtually, to celebrate our dad's remarkable life. It means so much to us, and I'm sure dad is felling from heaven right now. It was Emma, Linda's daughter, and the first grandchild who as a baby affectionately changed dad's name to Ish. What a strange name, right? Not Papa or Grandpa, but Ish. But no name suited dad more. As Amy shared, Ish means the man in Hebrew. And dad was indeed the man. Larger than life, gregarious, 
and full of work. Dad was the man to many, as you've heard today. And of course, he was the man to us. He was the center of our universe. Our anchor, our compass, and our barometer. To say we are lucky to have him is an understatement. We won the lottery with our parents. BB was the perfect match for dad. She was his little sparrow and truly the wind beneath, beneath his wings. She continues to be a source of strength and inspiration to her children and grandchildren. She is one strong lady and we love her very much. Dad was 81 when he passed. Yesterday would have been his 83rd birthday. We were blessed to have him for as long as we did after his diagnosis. We spent many holidays thinking this was going to be our last together. We even celebrated his 79th birthday in grand style because we didn't think dad would make it to 80, but he was strong. That extra time gave us the chance to tell dad on a regular basis how much he was loved, how much he was admired, how much he was respected. This was a blessing. My dad was more than a father to me. He was a teacher and a friend too. I learned so many valuable lessons about how to live an honorable life from my dad. And I'd like to share a few of these lessons with you today. Number one, hard work is the key to success. It doesn't matter where you come from or how little you have, you can succeed in life by working hard. As you know, my dad came from humble beginnings, but he worked hard in everything he did. When he was in high school, he worked in a pickle factory. He would never eat relish again after that experience. <laughs> and one summer, he helped pave I-75 as it runs through Adel. He was not afraid to work hard. And as you know, he took that work in his profession through dental school, through college. Um, I'm not gonna go so much on his career because you've heard from all his wonderful colleagues. But, you know, he, he went, he graduated with, uh, em, from Emory with honors in a time, it was in the 1960s when it was really hard for a Jewish person to get through that program. And somehow with his charismatic way and just knowing how to navigate this world, he got through, he passed with honors. And that is quite extraordinary. And as you know, he created a successful practice in orthodontics. He was a leader locally, nationally, internationally in organized dentistry. He's affected so many young people's lives and their futures. And he did it with a full heart. He loved it. He loved what he did. Okay. Let's see, I'm gonna get lost. Lesson number two, everyone is important. This is probably the most influential truth my dad imparted to me. I always admired his genuine interest and care for others. It didn't matter a person standing in this world. He treated everyone with equal respect, dignity, and genuine interest. Um, as everyone talks about him walking down the beach, those are definitely memories of our childhood. But I do remember one day walking the beach with my dad. He ran into a man who had done some maintenance work for him in the past. He was thin, he was missing teeth. He looked like he hadn't had a bath in days. My dad talked to him, he knew him. He was friends with him. He talked to him for what felt like 20 minutes, just kibitzing like they were great friends. And why wouldn't he? 
be talking to him. Not too long ago, dad befriended his landscaper, Jeremy. And after Jeremy finished doing his work, he was so hot and he was sweaty. He would come in, dad would give him some iced tea or tell mom to give him some iced tea. They would sit down on mom's nice, beautiful fabric sofa that I know she was like, put a towel under Jeremy, sweaty. But it didn't matter, dad would just sit there like he was his son, talking and hearing about Jeremy's life and how he could help him. And as we all know, there isn't a waitress around who hasn't been interrogated by my dad. He really did treat all people the same, no matter their position in life. And I really admire this quality. Lesson number three, always count your blessings. Dad never took his good fortune for granted. He used to say, how is it we got so lucky? Why were we born in America with all this wealth and opportunity, with food in our belly, a nice house where there, when there are children starving in Ethiopia? He often reflected on his good fortune and he helped me realize at a very young age just how lucky I was. Number four, giving is good. Dad was generous, not just to his family and friends, but to his community. Dad supported many causes, too many for me to name, but his generosity to the very building we sit in today deserves recognition. He loved the BBJ synagogue, his rabbi, and valued his Jewish heritage. He was generous both with his time and wallet. In fact, he is the past president of the synagogue and was a faithful member attending Saturday services for as long as he was able. The BBJ was very important to dad, so it is fitting we celebrate his life here today. Dad was also caring and compassionate to his colleagues. Soon after dad retired, a friend and orthodontist in Atlanta got very sick and he was unable to run his practice. Dad would drive to Atlanta every week and run his practice until they were able to sell it. I'm not sure how many months this went on, but it was incredible what he was doing. I do believe he also did this with another orthodontist in Savannah as well. My dad was such an incredible person, a true mensch. Lesson number five, don't take yourself too seriously. My dad liked to laugh, and while a sense of humor could be crude and offbeat at times, I thought he was hilarious. Just hearing him laugh would make me laugh. With dad around, we were never bored and could always find something to joke about, no matter the absurdity. When my kids tell me I'm weird, I take that as a tremendous compliment because I am proud to share my dad's sense of humor. This takes me to lesson number six, embrace life. Dad knew how to live. He took life by the horns and went with it, no matter what it was. When it came to his children's hobbies and interests, he was all in. Whether it was pulling horse trailers, chasing ponies, or, or organizing dentists to defend the Okefenokee Swamp because Josh cared about it, he did it with full heart. Throughout our lives, dad embraced our friends and catered to our every whim. He would buy us expensive cars and take us on exotic trips because he could. Dad was proud of his ability to provide for his family for he was able to give us a life he had never had. When it came to our education careers, he let us chart our own path and supported us, not just financially, but emotionally too. I am grateful for my dad's zest for life. Lesson number seven, do the best you can. My dad was a fighter. I admired his optimism, his courage and strength as he dealt with his cancer diagnosis and treatment. I appreciated his willingness to do whatever it took to manage the condition and not get frustrated by the many trips to Houston and the uncertainty that comes with living with cancer. He taught me that no matter how great the challenge, 
All we can do is what we can do. And that is enough. Lesson number eight, everything matters. Dad also taught me that everything matters, even the bad stuff. While hardships are not easy, Dad understood that failure matters as much as success, sadness as much as happiness, and despair as much as peace. For you can't truly know one without the other. The highs and lows of life all have value. My dad was as good as they did. He was my superhero, he was my rock. I loved him, I still do with all my heart. And I'm so proud to be his daughter. I admire his discipline, his determination and dedication to his family and his profession. His generosity was endless and beyond measure. He taught me to work hard and believe in myself. And he taught me to be kind to all people, no matter who they are or where they come from. What a special gift to give a daughter. When I was a little girl, I used to think, what would I do if something happened to my parents? I couldn't survive. When dad was initially diagnosed with lung cancer, I was overwhelmed with grief and fear. The past few years of his life were especially hard. Seeing him struggle and not being able to help. But what we come to realize is that we are all stronger than we think. Of course, the holes in our hearts never mend, but I live my life guided by the values I learned from my dad. And while he is not here physically, I still lean on him to guide me just as I did when he was walking this earth. The words written on dad's tombstone says it all. Dr. Leon Aronson, beloved husband, father, grandfather, and I would add friend, a leader, a mentor, a man of wisdom, generosity, and hum humor, who gave much and knew not that he gave it all. Thank you. Now I'd like to bring up uh, Liam and Barbara's oldest granddaughter, Emma Belter, affectionately known as my baby, <laughs> even though she's not my baby. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I've written some stuff down, but everyone said every single thing I wanted to say. So, or not every single thing, but um, I think I just want to wrap things up today. Jacob, my cousin, and I are going to sing a song in a second, um, Bye Bye Blackbird, which is one of Isha's favorite songs. Um, and so, yeah, I think I just, uh, for me, um, I know Isha is still with us in a different form now. And I am always reminded of that when I see a blackbird. Um, after his funeral, when it was just our family, we were sitting on the porch and we saw a little bird perching and he wouldn't leave us alone. <laughs> um, and so whenever I see a blackbird, I remember my grandpa and I'm just, unbelievably thankful um, that I had 26 years of life um, with someone who loved me and supported me so much and really um, not only showed that in words but in action and that means a lot. Uh, so if you guys see a blackbird today I hope you'll be reminded of my grandpa. Ish. So yeah, I guess Jacob, we're gonna sing a little song for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Bye bye blackbird. 
Uh, yes, and if you know the song, do feel free to sing along. Uh, much less lonely that way. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, a oh, one, two, three, four. Back up on my carry wall, here I go, singing low. Bye-bye, Blackbird. When somebody waits for me, sugar sweet, so is she. Bye-bye, Blackbird. No one here can love and understand. Stories they all hand me. Make my bed and light the light. I'll be back late tonight. Bye 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 bye. bye, 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 bye. So much has been said, so much more should be said. But in Judaism, we look upon a person's life as a gift from God and as an opportunity for us to learn and to grow and to continue. So therefore, I'd like to take this moment as we conclude, and we're gonna have a little bit of wine, and we're going to say L'chaim. Which means, that's it. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Linda. We have Linda, Barbara, Amy, Eddie. I hope the wine is good. BP. Okay. There you go. She doesn't know. Okay. You all spoke so beautifully. <laughs> said blessing then we'll drink life goes on and we thank God for letting Leon Aronson be part of our lives Thank you, Barbara, for making this possible. Thank you, Leon. We know you're watching out on the pros. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.